pleased to welcome to the show uh, the captain, uh, captain from the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, she's been with the LAPD since 1995. Um, she is as has a long um, career within the department, currently over uh, Southeast uh, Division, but has been recently promoted to deputy chief over the brand new Community Safety Partnership Bureau. Um, Captain Amada Tingridis, welcome to the front page. Good morning, Dominic. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. Congratulations on your promotion. I understand you're only the second African-American uh, woman ever to reach that post of deputy chief. Yes, I am the second right behind deputy chief Regina Scott, who currently oversees all of South Los Angeles for the LAPD. And you tell me what uh, this new bureau is, the um Community Safety Partnership. It's a spinoff of something that's already going on, right, in partnership with the um, Department of Housing? Yes. It actually is a program that started in 2011 in conjunction with the Housing Authority City of Los Angeles. Um, the brainchild of this Community Safety Partnership program um, is civil rights attorney Connie Rice. And when we started in 2011, the primary focus was for officers to build relationships and start working in some of our public housing developments in Watts and East Los Angeles in Ramona Gardens. Since then, the program has grown and we are in three out of the four bureaus throughout Los Angeles with officers really engaging, attempting to build trust and work within the communities. We have two community safety partnership programs that are not in the public housing developments, but they're actually centered around parts that had experienced some violent crime over the past few years. Right. And, you know, we love attorney Connie Rice. Um, also, I know, you know, the partnership with uh, GRID, the gang reduction and youth development um, in terms of this being, you know, a community based program that also includes the gang intervention component has also uh, been important, right? Absolutely. In fact, I don't, in fact, I know we would not be as successful with addressing some of the violent crime and gang conflict without the communication of our crisis intervention workers and gang intervention workers in some of these CSP zones. Um, the Housing Authority and the Mayor's Grid Program has been instrumental in attempting to bring all parties and resources together to address the communities. Okay, and you know, and I know that you uh, and your husband are both very respected, you know, within the community. But right now is a time when the community is saying we have too many police. So creating a whole new bureau and expanding, it just, it seems very tone deaf in some ways. Dominique, I, I understand that concern. And uh, what's really important to know is we are not adding additional resources to the CSP program. These are already existing officers that have been working in these communities, specifically the ones in Walton East LA. They've been working in those communities for almost a decade. The purpose for standing up the Bureau and promoting a deputy chief is just to ensure that all of the teams that are working within these communities are aligned with the mission and vision of what this program is. There are a lot of families that have been engaged with these officers for almost 10 years who want and like this type of relationship-based policing, who are encouraging these programs. There are other couple districts throughout the city who would like to have a CSP program within their areas. It's not perfect. The UCLA study that was done, it took a year to do. They really spent some time gathering quantitative and qualitative analysis for the program. And there were some things that needed to be fixed. And the purpose of setting up this bureau was to address those 45 recommendations and attempting to answer what the community wanted and and fix some of the concerns within the program and some of those concerns were simply continuing to ensure that the community still has a voice in the strategic plan 
what the officers were doing, a deeper engagement within the community. And all of these suggestions came from the community um, within this UCLA study. Yeah, and the, the UCLA study did, it showed that this is, you know, it seems to be effective. I mean, the community policing model is one that we would like to see more of. But on the other hand, people are saying, well, the things that they're talking about doing, such as, you know, working with the housing authorities, such as doing youth sports and all of these kinds of programs that we do need recreation uh, for for particularly the um, housing developments. Why should they be handled by police as opposed to recreation directors and, you know, housing experts? And, you know, and, and I, I believe I heard you quoted saying that, you know, yes, the, the LAPD does end up doing things that maybe could be handled by another uh, organization, which is one of the things that has been, you know, on the table uh, with Black Lives Matter and the movement for black lives and, you know, the anti-racist movement. But but that's exactly what the uh, it sounds like exactly what um your new bureau is doing uh, and and that's so critical um the reason why the program is called community safety partnership is because we all need to work together our initial response to working in these communities was because of the violent crime occurring in these communities and the lack of trust between law enforcement and the community. So we initially started off wanting to get to know the community on a deeper level, assigning these police officers to these communities with a five-year commitment, getting the officers engaged in being present and walking footbeats, walking footbeats along the corridor to ensure that the kids weren't getting robbed um, on their way back and forth to school. Those relationships and talking to the is what created some of our youth programs because the community felt that there was a lack of. And so starting the Watts Rams football team, coordinating with the Girl Scout troops, coordinating with the school, conducting field trips, those were all requests and needs that the community asked the CSP officers to take part in. Our goal is not to take over and run all of these programs. Our goal is to be a partner side by side, engaging with the youth so that we can build the relationships and collaborate to address quality of life concerns in the CFP zones. Okay, we're now being joined by the council member from Council District 8, the uh, former president and CEO of the Community Coalition and now, of course, council member Marquise Harris Dawson. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Dominique, uh, and good morning to the Front Page family. Uh, well, it's great to hear from you, everything being uh, socially distant at the moment, um, yes. here and not see. Um, you know, I was um, surprised to see the rollout of this um, community safety partnership right now in the middle of, you know, national, local, global uh, calls to defund the police, to reprioritize police budgets, and to move police away from doing tasks and, and, and roles in the community that could possibly be better carried out by others. Uh, take me, help me under, get my mind around this, because um, yeah, I know you. that I'm not alone in, in struggling with that. Yeah, thank you, Dominique. I think, uh, you know, I think the timing can be, uh, can make it confusing. And I think the, the media portrayal of the program can be, can make it confusing as well. I think a, a few things. One is I've been working on and folks have been working on, Ahmad has been working on, or should I say Deputy Chief T. Reeves has been working on community safety partnership for over a decade. Um, and when I got on the council, I had to go scrape and borrow and beg uh, supporters to get the resources to have the community safety partnership. Uh, and so it's been something that's been in the works a long time. It is not at all a response to what uh, the demand of the, that the demand that the movement has been making at this time. So something that's been in the works for a long time. So let me just set that aside. The second thing I would say about the task that people do and are you, are you putting police where social workers should be? Obviously uh, we need, far more social workers, we need far more uh, employees at parks, we need far more people doing community activities. The reason why officers involve themselves in those activities in the community safety partnership 
is because the point is to build a relationship with the neighborhood. There's no way to have accountability from police officers, and I believe, frankly, no way for policing to be done if you don't have a relationship with the people that you're supposed to be guarding. Now, if 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 the role, if all you're supposed to be doing is um, uh, policing them or or trying to catch people or or uh, uh, just strictly trying to um, enforce adherence to the law, then yeah, you don't need a relationship for that. You know, the military does that all over the world. I don't think that's what you should have in neighborhoods. I think what you should have in neighborhoods is police officers who are clear that they work for the neighborhood, they're a part of the neighborhood, and they're accountable to the neighborhood. Can't do that without a relationship. And officers in the community safety partnerships uh, pursued these programs and continue to pursue these programs as a way of building relationships. And, uh, you know, I think part of what happens is when the mayor and others talk about it and they say, we're reimagining police, we're this, we're that. I mean, I think you heard uh, Brother Akili from Black Lives Matter LA saying, hey, you know, don't don't co-opt the, the language, don't co-opt the movement, um, you know, by saying that by doing this, you're somehow meeting the goals of the yeah. anti-racist movement. I, told, I couldn't agree with, with Brother Keeley more on that particular point. This does not meet the goals of the Black Lives Movement. This is not a response to the Black Lives Movement, at least as far as Marquise Aristotle is concerned. This is something that we've been working on for a long time. Uh, you know, the, the, the timing is not ideal. I would like this to have been done three years ago, four years ago, eight years ago, frankly. Um, the, uh, there are some things, including an evaluation, uh, that was done by Georgia Leap and, and, uh, scholars at UCLA, uh, that folks were waiting to get done. Uh, but again, people, no one should confuse this as a response to what we've seen in the streets. We have very specific motions, some of which we've discussed about, you know, ending driving while black, uh, uh, ending, um, uh, the response, the uh, ending uh, police as a first responder to things like mental health crises and homeless encampments. Uh, and we'll continue to move forward to, with that work. Um, yeah, I, I want to ask um, Captain uh, Tingariti, she's still there, uh, Deputy Chief, can I say now? Is it official? Mm -hmm. Does it become official Sunday or is it official now? Well, I'm going to say it, Deputy it, Chief. <laughs> yeah. I, I appreciate that, Dominique. It'll be official um, sometime after uh, the second week of August. Ah, got it. So what is your vision? What is your vision for, you know, what you will do with this bureau? I mean, it's, it, you know... It's a time when people are going to be, I'm sure, scrutinizing it more than ever. And also, you know, a time when people can say, oh, of course they picked a black woman. You know, it's it's almost like a, a front or a token type of situation. Um, so what is your actual vision proactively for what you would like to do with this bureau? Well, let me address the, the theme of black and, and being a token. Absolutely. Um, I, I think. I, I've been very fortunate, you know, Dominique, I grew up and watched um, Family Roots in South LA. Um, I've been working in the community for over 25 years. And um, my heart and my passion and understanding for the community has never changed. I spent a lot of time in Southwest working in Council District 8, eight years as a senior lead officer, really engaging and learning um, to understand uh, gang intervention and the need and how law enforcement needs to respond um, to what the community wants us to be and needs us to be. I've been working in this program for 10 years and have helped it get ingrained in deepened relationships throughout uh, South Los Angeles and Boyle Heights in East LA. And so the chief saw that I would be the best person to be able to head this bureau and be promoted, not because of the color of my skin, but because of the work that I have done consistently throughout my 25 years with the organization. And the fact that I'm a female black and the second one in the history of the Los Angeles Police Department also shows that the chief recognizes we do need to be represented 
within our organization. And it means a lot to the community. What I envision for this program is to continue doing what the Community Safety Partnership Office are doing. I envision us building more relationships, talking to the people who don't agree with this program, understanding why, taking suggestions from the community, but at the same time still addressing some of the crime and some of the social ills within these communities. What I really see eventually is the communities taking over some of these youth programs and officers just being there and being a part of the programs. Um, I envision more people within the community doing some of the things that we do for some of the smaller issues like the gambling or the drinking in public. Could we have community ambassadors address those issues and those concerns and just coordinate and communicate with us on their successes of it? Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, Council Member Marquise Harris Dawson, one of the concerns that comes up is that there is surveillance being done of youth um, that, you know, uh, these these uh, CSP officers are gathering data uh, that is, you know, sort of pumped into the predictive policing uh, models and maybe, you know, invasive or even uh, violating the rights of people in the community. Well, you know, I mean, I think if we find that, uh, we got to deal with it aggressively. I mean, I think, you know, that kind of question, it's, and it's certainly I, I will confess those are kinds of questions that I have all the time about a variety of activities of police, including the ones, uh, including when folks are doing things that, that may seem benign. Uh, I, I think that speaks to the history of distrust, right? So you, yeah. you nobody trusts the police. Like, I just, you know, to put it frankly. Well, and it's uh, not nobody, just some random, you know, ethereal course, mistrust. I mean, evidence. look at, yeah, yeah. the Cal gangs is perfect. Yeah. Right. Cal gangs, I mean, when I worked at Community Coalition, when I was the, the head of Community Coalition, every black or brown male that was on my staff that was under the age of 55 was in the gang database. And you know the staff of the coalition. Members. Yeah. Half of the, you know, there were half of the people were college and graduate school graduates. And they were yeah. still in gang database. So there's lots of good reasons for distrust um, to happen. So the question becomes, what do you do about that? And, and where do you start? I think one of the great things about the CSB program, and, and it's one of the things that moved me on this program, oh, some uh, seven, eight years ago, I, there was a police shooting. And we were having a meeting. Some ministers, black ministers, asked me to come to a meeting on 88th in Vermont. And in walks this black woman. And, and of course, Dominique, I say to myself, of course, LAPD sends a black woman to deal with this. Let's see what, she, you know, let's see what she's going to say. And she gets up and says, this killing shouldn't have happened. And I, for one, am sorry about it. And then we could at least have a conversation. It doesn't bring the person back to life. It doesn't undo the harm. Um, but at least it puts us in the position where we can have a conversation. And again, I think you can say, uh, we don't trust each other, so let's walk away from each other forever. Or you can put processes in place to try to do that and try to work with individuals that you can. I think, you know, uh, Captain Tingarides has been a person like that, and I think there are others. Uh, and the CSP program allows those people to come to the fore. Okay, let's go to Charles from 1-800-UNITE-US. Charles, I need the short version, if you would. Okay, 70% uh, drop in police fatalities when the police chief is black. 90% of black men are arrested are unemployed. And corporations make a lot of money uh, promoting uh, violence against uh, black people, domestic terrorism, through the rap. Okay, so your question. Black people. Well, my question is... Uh, I'd like to know what, what can be done is specifically about the rap music. Can we at least speak out publicly about it and, and, and challenge these corporations for targeting our black youth? So you want the LAPD to get involved with monitoring music? Okay. okay um, so I don't know how you would respond to that. I guess that is definitely for uh, Deputy Chief Tingaridis. Um, what the relationship between you know rap music or violent music and um, community violence and what can be done about it? Well, uh, Dominique, that, that's a that's a great question, and I think first and foremost we have to understand that for many um, music is about culture. And um, you don't hear as much um, 
cursing or um, negative things said about women um, on the radio. Now it's kind of underground and on uncensored stations. And so people have a choice to want to listen to that. They have to go to those locations and stations to find that type of music. And it has definitely changed over the past 15, uh, 20 years. Um, I think that it's about culture and teaching young men and women um, respect and and what it means if someone hears a song that's got uh, a negative word in it or is glorifying a gang. I also think that that goes back to the programming and getting youth involved in art and in music and sports and leadership and shifting their mind to what they think is enjoyable or or popular. Yep. Um, we can talk more about that family on Radio Free Friday when we open up our phones. Uh, just, I know we're tight on time here, but I do want to... Uh, have uh captain tingaritas if you would talk about how you know this five years in one neighborhood is actually pretty unusual for any um officer right and also what are the things that you are most proud of or most feel are most impactful about the community safety partnership yes uh, five years is unique and um normally when an officer graduates the academy they do one year of probation they they leave that uh, division and then they will what we call wheel or move to another division and you see officers cycle throughout and then you have patrol officers that choose to work in communities and they can spin in upwards from 10 to 15 years there the uniqueness about the cfp officers is they dedicate five years to that specific area whereas officers working patrol respond from radio call to radio call in different areas throughout the division that we're working in. I now have officers that have been working in some of these sites for almost 10 years, and they are attending now the graduations of some of the kids that they've been engaged with for a while. They've been invited to birthday parties, to quinceanera, to christenings, to funerals. They have built these deep relationships uh, almost to the point where the family consider these officers to be part of their families. The result of building trust in some of these communities has been a reduction in violent crime. Prior to starting in the councilman wanting to have a CSP program um, centered around the Harvard Park area, we had six homicides. Harvard Park is finishing up his third year and we have not had one. So the result of the CSP officers being engaged in the community, working with our crisis intervention and gang intervention workers. And what's really key to Dominique is the engagement of the council districts, the engagement of their field deputies. They are out there too, side by side, ensuring that there is coordination with the community that shows the community that they're involved and invested in their districts. And the fact that we've had a reduction of violent crime in Council District 8 centered around that park is what I really hope for, for children to feel safe, to be able to go out into their communities, to play at the park and partake in activities that are provided by, you know, the rec and parks or parks and recreation in the community. Okay, we have um, less than a minute. Uh, Council member uh, Marquise Harris Dawson, two quick points. People say that one of the UCLA res researchers, this guy Jeff Brantingham, uh, was involved with the predictive policing tool, which makes, you know, maybe sheds a different light on the study. And also there's co been controversy about how the program is funded because it's not part of the regular LAPD funding. It's funded by private dollars. What does that mean? Does that mean we're going to end up putting some of that 150 that million that was cut out back in? Does it mean that there's no real commitment to the program on the part of the department? Well, I'll start with the last part because uh, that's the part I know about. So none of the $150 million will go into this program. I, you know, I've argued from the time I got on council that we have a program that shows it reduces crime, it reduces arrests, and it reduces uh, complaints against police officers uh, for brutality. You, you hit all those notes, and we have to go out and raise money to, to, to fund this program. I want to see that turned around. There are other far more controversial programs that LAPD has that are not 
uh, that that you don't have to raise money for that comes straight like out Metro. of the budget. So, like <laughs> Metro, right? Like so, right? It's very controversial. It has lots of liability. I don't know. Um, maybe Captain T. Reed can talk about this. But you know, the liability lawsuits against CSP. Uh, officers or programs are much lower than it is d- d- against the the rest of the force, particularly Metro. Those stuff, those things get funded without question. We have to beg and borrow for community safety partnership. I expect that to change, uh, and not a penny of the hundred fifty million dollars should go for that. Moreover, we shouldn't have okay. to go to foundations to fund it as well. So let let me go. Let me let me do do that there. I don't know the person that you're referring to or the the part about the study. I will say this though, and, and I'll close. And I'll thank you for your Real time. Quick. Yeah. Just, just in this month, Gregory Taylor, 32 years old, African American, Carnell Lawson, Deshaun Washington, Otis Williams, 14 year old, African American, okay, Angelica I- Vargas, six years old. These are the these are these are the homicide victims, and so you know I, I I really appreciate the tradition that Black Lives Matter has started about saying people's names. These are the names of the homicide victims in July alone in South LA. Uh, Got it. And I, I have to leave it there, Councilman. That right away. Got to leave it there, Councilman. Uh, thank you so much, Marquise Harris Dawson and uh, Deputy Chief uh, Tangaridis. We got to go, family. Passing the mic to Steve Harvey. Until next time, one love.